Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai. He hi aki ana te atākura, he tio, he hoka, he hauhu, ti hei Māori ora. Kia ora Kirsty for that karakia. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us today for our third session of Changing Tides, Tai Torua, the web series that takes an in-depth look at our moana, the ocean. Thank you for making time to be a part of this panel discussion. And to those of the, you who have joined us over the last two weeks, welcome back. And a warm kia ora to those of you who are here for the first time. Today's session will be a little bit different to the previous two weeks because this day, instead of three speakers, we have six panelists from a range of organizations, including a senior analyst, a Matauranga Māori advisor, a scientist, a publisher, an artisan fisher person, and a dive tourism operator. And they all have one thing in common the best interests of the Moana at heart. I'm your host, Elizabeth Easter, and like most New Zealanders, I've seen huge changes to the marine environment in my lifetime. And as a journalist, I'm always looking for answers to find ways to help protect the oceans from further degradation so they may flourish. Tai Tōrua is brought to you today by WWF New Zealand and Te Papa Atawhai, the Department of Conservation. Thank you to those organisations for making this series possible. And thank you too to our panellists today, who are Kirsty Woods, Tai Moana Senior Analyst at Te Ohu Kai Moana, Joron Jungians, the owner of Dive Tutukaka, Dr. Libby Liggins, Senior Lecturer and Research Academic in Marine Ecology at Massey University, Liana Barabal, Kai Tohu Tuakana Matauranga Māori for the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment, Carl Waugh, Artisan Fisher Person and owner of Better Fishing in Hawke's Bay, and James Frankham, Publisher and Director of New Zealand Geographic. This series provides opportunities for us to learn from our panellists' knowledge, to ask them questions, and also to create connections. Dialogue will be opened and debate is encouraged, all in the name of working towards improving the health, the Modi of our moana. Thank you for joining us. But first, as with all conferences, whether online or face-to-face, -face, a little bit of housekeeping. Chat. A chat window will be open for the first 10 minutes of this session. You can use that facility to ask any questions if you're having technical problems. Q&A. There is a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, a box will pop up and you can type in any questions, although they will be filtered to avoid duplications and any that are off topic will be deleted. Bearing in mind this is just one hour with six incredible panellists, we probably won't get to answer every question, but you can also email marine at doc.gov.nz if your question isn't answered or to connect with us about any aspect of this forum. Voting. If you see a question appear that you would have wanted to ask, rather than ask it again, give it the thumbs up and that will help move that question to the top of the pile. We will endeavour to ask the, answer the questions with the most votes, um, so do let your thumbs do the talking. Recording. This session is being recorded and will be put on YouTube. Today's will be uploaded tomorrow on the WWF New Zealand website, our channel, along with the previous week's seminars. So if you know people who would like to have been here today but couldn't, you can share that with them. And our kaupapa is very, very simple. Please be respectful in your comments and your questions. And this week, differing from previous talks, we will begin by having each speaker introduce themselves to tell us a little bit about themselves and also about their relationship to the question, which is weathering the storm. Then we'll get straight to the questions and discussion. And because we're all in different Zoom rooms, we're going to go old school, or actually literally like school, and when a panellist who isn't speaking wishes to contribute, they will raise their hand to indicate their readiness to speak. Please also remember these sessions are simply the starting points for ongoing conservation conversations. For any other comments, do please email marine at doc.gov.nz. So, the third web webinar in the Tai Torua series, Weathering the Storm, where the focus is on the effects of climate change on the marine environment, from its impact, our potential responses, and also solutions. We'll explore what we currently know what we expect to see in the future, and then put forward ideas for ways we can be more resilient. A healthy ocean is essential to the fight against climate change, and fighting climate change is essential for a healthy ocean. 
Now I'm going to invite each speaker to um, tell us a little bit about themselves. And our first panelist today, Kirsty Woods. Kia ora, Kirsty. Koro hine o ku pai maunga, ko rangi tike toku awa, no ko ngati hoati toku iwi, ko Kirsty Woods aho. Kia ora koutou. I work for Te Ohu Kaiwana, which was set up as a trust to look after a treaty settlement between Māori and the Crown that settled all the fisheries claims um, against the Treaty of Waitangi. And so our role is to really advance iwi interests in fisheries and the marine environment generally, and to really support them in the management of their fisheries and really help ensure that the settlement endures. So this settlement essentially is very important in terms of re helping iwi and Māori generally re-establish their relationship with Tangaroa. And it did that through the um, really guarantee of access to certain rights in commercial and non-commercial fishing. I mean, once upon a time, iwi managed all their fishing, whether it's commercial or non-commercial themselves and within their own framework. But now we're looking at managing those things in separate ways. And so fisheries are really important to Māori communities for sustenance, for maintaining a relationship on the water, and really accessing kaimwana. So the settlement gave iwi and their local communities the ability to manage that kind of fishing themselves. And that's a very important thing. And we've seen, even during COVID-19, a lot of stress on local communities not being able to get out there and fish. Um, and having to access fisheries in other ways. On the commercial side, um, iwi have always been involved in commerce. Um, in terms of the fishery settlement, what they ended up with was a share of all the commercial fisheries that are in the quota management system. And so that's a modern expression of part of their original customary rights. And so essentially, this is also part of the benefit that fisheries provide to iwi through the income that they receive. And, through which they can support their people. So climate change has obviously got big implications for iwi in terms of maintaining their relationship with tangaroa and maintaining their fisheries. And as a lot of your previous speakers and other sessions have said, there's a lot going on. There's temperature rise, fisheries are moving, ocean acidification affects shellfish and so on, and increased sedimentation as well from rainfall and so on. So there's a lot to get to grips with. And so clearly this whole issue affects our relationship with tangaroa and fisheries. So I guess what we're interested in is, is looking at how do we start to take action to deal with these things. Um, we might have fishing rights on the one hand, but we've also got responsibilities to deal with the management of the fisheries and the effects on the environment generally. So our challenge is to build on our collective wisdom and our knowledge and access science and the knowledge of other people and work together to deal with us. So that's me for now. Kia ora. Kia ora, Kirsty. Uh, and now we're going to hear from uh, Joron Yongians from Tutukaka. Kia ora, Joron. Kia ora, Elizabeth. Thanks for the introduction and thanks, Kirsty, for your uh, uh, little korero as well. Uh, very important, all of this. I'm originally from the Netherlands. I've been for 40 years in New Zealand. I've been diving for about 38 years and I've been in business for 27 years. Dive to the Kaak is our business. We take out about 15,000 people per annum, and we've conducted probably 350,000 dives at the Poor Nights um, since I've been in business. We're into sustainability, or well, we try to be. We love the Poor Nights. Uh, we're into triple bottom line reporting as well. So our business has to make sense from a social, from an economic, and an environmental uh, point of view. From a social point of view, we're looking after the 60 staff. We've had over 500 over the years. And we're looking after our community, our local schools, uh, and our visitors. We get about 15,000 per annum. From an environmental point of view, of course, we are looking after the poor nights and promote, promote marine reserves whenever we can. And we're very passionate about that. Uh, and from an economic point of view, we have to make it work. It's all kind of add up. All the things we do, it's a capital intensive industry. We've got lots of weather that sort of influences whether we can go out or not. So there's lots of variables. So climate change is one of the variables that's upon us at the moment. And uh, we have to work with that. At the poor nights, we notice uh, an increase uh, in, in subtropical fish. We notice an increase, a little bit of an increase in, in uh, water temperature. And the weather that's sort of around us, uh, we have 
bigger storms, we have drier weather, uh, shorter, heavier rainfalls. Uh, but yeah, we start already noticing uh, climate change having an effect on our environment. So what do we do uh, at the Poor Nights Islands? We uh, make customers aware of the uh, amazing environment we have at the Poor Nights and what it would be like if we had some more marine reserves uh, around New Zealand. We've lost a lot of our biodiversity and we try to promote increases back into more fish into the ocean. So we talk about industrial overfishing and how we need to sort of change the way we extract fish from the ocean. And we talk about climate change, what it, what it does to us. So what do we do? Yeah, how do we adapt to these changing worlds around us? Um, well, we'd like to see uh, by 20, 30, 30% of all the waters around the world in a really uh, strong marine protection. We believe if we wanna keep biodiversity in our oceans, then that's what we have to do. And we've been really, really slack in New Zealand at moving marine protection forward, unfortunately. The other thing we try to do is um, uh, reducing our footprint, you know, trying to be better uh, in our business and, and, and have less impact. And we've been trying to electrify some of our boats. That's gonna take some time because the technology isn't quite there and uh, we're just doing our best. Every step we can make, we'll move forward to protect our environment. And so climate change, um, yes, it's an important thing for us. Uh, marine reserves and marine life is absolutely central to what we do. And hopefully with these sessions that uh, WWF and DOC are doing, we st see some more people actually really getting stuck into making sure that we protect our moana. Kia ora, that's it for starters. Kia ora, Joran. And now I'm going to hand to Dr. Libby Liggins. Libby, kia ora. Tēnā koutou. My name is Libby Liggins. I'm a research scientist and lecturer at Massey University in Auckland. And my research is interested in marine biodiversity around Aotearoa, New Zealand, as well as the wider Pacific. And particularly, I'm interested in how understanding how our biodiversity and ecosystems will change as a result of climate change once we start to see species responding to the ocean climate change that we have seen um, around our coastline. So I think through the webinar series so far, we've learnt that there certainly has been changes to our ocean environment in terms of the physical oceanography and also the temperatures around our coastal environment. Um, what is less understood is what kind of biodiversity responses or what biodiversity changes have happened over that same scale of decadal change we're seeing in our ocean um, environment. So my research tries to address this data void um, using a number of approaches. I'll, I'll mention two right now. The first is using DNA of organisms. So by looking at the uh, DNA or relatedness of individuals within a population in the marine environment, we can understand more about a species relationship to place. We can understand how long that species has been in that place whether it's been undergoing a decline as a result of potentially climate change or um, potentially an increase that may signal that it is one of the climate change winners and we might see a range shift in that species, for example. So we use DNA to get this sort of hindcast view of a former baseline that we don't have scientific data for necessarily. But of course, as New Zealanders, we also have a great um, amount of knowledge about our own marine environment and we have generational experience of that. So, Another aspect of my research is about enabling those citizen scientists among us who have local ecological knowledge, matauranga, about our local rohe, um, about those kinds of changes that we have seen and we feel are indicative of change. So harnessing those um, indicators of change, sightings of new species, increases in the number of a certain animal or displacement of a certain animal um, or plant um, or algae. Um, and, and using that to guide research in the future for understanding what kinds of changes we might see, where we should look for those changes as scientists. So really looking forward to hearing what the panel has to say and um, to get this interaction with um, the many people hopefully who are viewing today. So kia ora. Kia ora Libby. And now we're here with Liana Barabal. Kia ora Liana. Tēnā tātou katoa, uh, ko Liana Barabal tōku ingoa, he uri ahau o Ngāti Kahanganu me Te um, I, uh, Hello everybody, um, I am uh, connected to the marine environment through very many 
pathways. Um, I whakapapa um, directly through up to Tangaroa, um, but I also work in um, the environmental space and particularly in the marine environment. Um, but I also play and take my whānau there um, regularly. Um, I like going diving and, um, you know, grabbing some power and canoe off the rocks if I can. Um, but I also take my family down as much as possible and we have, um, you know, we're always, we're always down there when we can. Um, some of the concerns that um, I have are quite broad in, in the sense that, um, you know, we can, we've seen climate change coming for a while and haven't been able to really front foot it because it is a, it is a worldwide issue. Um, but it is also a place-based issue and a lot of our um, mātauranga that um, our whānau have is very place-based and very specific to um, to a region or an area or even just a bay. It, it can be that, that small. Um, and so what I am really interested in is how do we utilise two of the two knowledge systems that exist in Aotearoa one of mātauranga and the other of um, science to be able to manage um, better um, the impacts that we are currently seeing um, of climate change. Um, and so one of the, a lot of the things that kind of jump out at me in terms of how we bring those two knowledge systems together is that, um, you know, there, it's a different angle. Mātauranga comes out of a different angle. Um, we look at the whole. We look at the connections. Whakapapa is a huge thing to Māori, Whakapapa, which is your genealogical traits, which also stem into the environment. Um, not, it's not just a personal genealogical line, it is a, a, a broader genealogical line. Um, so that connection is very important um, within a Mātauranga Māori scope. Um, and different to the way in which um, the, what's commonly known um, about the system. So humans are a part of the system, not not separate. Um, and then also kaitiakitanga um, is, is also uh, a very important concept within te ao Māori, the Māori worldview. Um, kaitiakitanga um, defined in English as kind of guardianship but it's actually a reciprocal relationship that you have with the environment and a reciprocal meaning if you take something you got to give back something um, and so how do we acknowledge that um, in a system that is currently um, putting the responsibility on more like local government and central government and and um, people that aren't a part of the, the direct community um, and I think that's some of the opportunities that we hold within Mātauranga is, is it's not just Māori knowledge, but it's the system um, of how we know things um, that has, I think, the biggest benefit in terms of how we adapt to climate change. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it for me until the questions come out. So kia ora. Kia ora, Liana. And now we're going to turn to Carl War. Kia ora, Carl. Kia ora. Uh, Carl War. So I'm a artisanal fisherman here in Hawke's Bay. So what that means is uh, I catch a small amount of fish and sell it locally here, direct to end consumers. I've been doing that for about two decades now and we, we found ourselves bottom trawling uh, when we first came to Hawke's Bay and we're still doing that. So bottom trawling is dragging heavy equipment, chains and ropes and things across the sea floor and uh, herding fish into a funnel and letting it gather up into a cod end uh, at the end of that funnel. Which you lift back to the boat and empty out and uh, take out what you need and discard what you don't need. Um, this is a very prominent system of fishing in the world today. Uh, it's not one that I enjoy but I don't think I'm going to be as much use standing on the outside of it saying I don't like it as I could be inside of it trying to see if I can bring about some changes with how we do it. So we're pretty invested at the moment in changing the technology that bottom trawling is. So we've been working 
and some of you may have seen articles on the web or on TV uh, about a cage that we attach to the end of the net. So the idea of that is um, just it's an analog device that just allows uh, the smaller fish to escape hopefully unharmed at depth. Um, fish that are caught at depth and brought to the surface and then released have to deal with barometric trauma which is for a fish the same as a human getting the bends which can be very painful and, and uh, quite often fatal. So lots of progress in that area. So that's why I'm still bottom trawling. Um, climate change, yes. So in the last couple of decades, I'm seeing uh, my fish leave the close near shore areas and they're going out a lot deeper. And I assume that is for seeking temperature. Um, warmer water doesn't hold as much oxygen. And if you need that oxygen for the immune system or to assist fecundity and that the breeding and the spawning of fish, then uh, you're going to have to go with the water's cooler. So I guess what I may be able to offer is uh, just some insight into the trends that I'm seeing year by year out there. So uh, we'll get into the conversation and see if I can help out with some questions there. Kia ora. Kia ora, Carl. And now our final sixth speaker, James Frankham. Kia ora, James. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. I uh, hope everybody is well out there on what is a bit of a rainy day. Um, my name is James Frankham. I'm the publisher of New Zealand Geographic and uh, nzgeo.com. Um, I've been a, a sailor since really before I could walk, I think. Um, I'm a, a diver and, and more recently uh, something of an advocate. Um, or outspoken um, person prone to outbursts about uh, protection for the seas. Um, New Zealand Geographic has an audience of about a million New Zealanders across print and web and social channels and, and all of those are curious about uh, the environment and uh, concerned about uh, the environment as well and in particular the relationship with society and uh, we have a natural bias uh, I suppose in our editorial towards uh, marine issues, um, being a, a country that is mostly salt water. Uh, so through New Zealand Geographic, uh, we've done a lot of reporting on climate um, and climate science over the years, particularly with a bias towards the marine environment. Uh, we've been at it for about 30 years. Uh, most recently, it's been through the uh, NZVR project, New Zealand Virtual Reality Project, which we've done in um, conjunction with the uh, Blake Trust and, and WWF has been involved recently as well. And we've attempted to give all New Zealanders something of a first-hand uh, experience of our oceans and um, everything within it. Uh, so it's involved filming around New Zealand, um, up towards the Three Kings, out to White Island, into the murky and cold waters of Taranaki, uh, as far north as uh, the Kermadec Islands and, and Niue. Um, and so we've, I've had a pretty interesting sort of sense and overview of uh, our marine environment recently uh, and all of these pro all of these different places have uh, threats on them um, many or most of those threats are related to um, extractive industries uh, particularly fishing commercial and recreational uh, but also to pollution and sedimentation um, uh, and all of them has this overlay um, over the top of that of the big one um, being uh, climate change, um, ocean acidification, sea level rise, increased frequency of storms, particularly in the tropics, uh, and the dangers that pose to um, coral reef systems, and uh, yeah, and, and sea level rise as well, and that affects society as much as it does um, biodiversity. So um, that goes for the places that are less far flung, I suppose, the places closer to our urban centres. Uh, and closer to us um, too. And for me, I think the place that I feel most connected to is in a little tiny uh, fibrolite batch down the eastern end of uh, Waiheke Island. Um, we've had three generations grow up down there uh, and each has seen across their lifetime uh, what are some pretty alarming changes. Um, and uh, I sort of felt like in my childhood, maybe that had bottomed out, but um, that's not true. Um, there's been some incredible reduction of uh, biodiversity there. But there's also been the slow creep of the sea inshore, clawing away at the foreshore. Um, I remember my grandmother planted some putakara along the shore about 40 years ago, a couple of meters inland, and uh, the sea is now 
torn those out by the roots. You know, it's washed in underneath the Putakawa there. We've had 240 millimetres of sea level rise in, in Auckland itself, but that was enough to go metres and metres inland. Uh, there's also a, a shell midden there in the bay, um, and it's the only evidence in the bay of pre-European uh, activity. And half of that midden has been clawed away by the sea too. So that's a, a thousand years of human culture swept away in the last 25 years. So uh, we don't have to look very far to realize um, how real all this is. Um, the projections for the next hundred years range from half a meter sea level rise to several meters with much of that change already baked in. So I feel very strongly that climate change is, um, how do we say, a, a problem for our present and not just for our future. Kia ora. Kia ora, James. Understandably very sobering. Um, actually, this whole topic is. So uh, let us get on to the questions and also hopefully some solutions because clearly they're incredibly pressing. Um, Panellists, if you could now please all turn on your videos so we can see you all at once, kind of like the Brady Bunch. And if you're not speaking and remember, if you have something um, you want to add, the hand is going to be handy. I'm going to start with a question for Libby Liggins. Libby, um, what is our level of knowledge of climate change and where does the information come from and how easy is it for general public to access it? Yeah, so I can offer a science perspective on that. And I think that um, based on what we've heard in these webinars and the work that's been coming out over recent years, we have pretty good understanding that it's definitely happening. We have measured over the last few decades what that change looks like, uh, climate change affecting the ocean uh, by means of acidification, um, temperature change, oceanography, uh, wave height, these sorts of things. We don't have good understanding, however, I think, on uh, what those biodiversity impacts have been. So this is where the stories we've heard from the panelists, and I'm sure many people listening in today, are really important. Um, it's been acknowledged, I think, nationally and probably internationally as well, that we lack understanding of how biodiversity has changed through time. Uh, we don't have those time series. So our national report from our Ministry for the Environment came out late last year. And although climate change and the impact on biodiversity was identified as a very priority issue, one of four priority issues for our marine environment, um, it was also acknowledged that we did lack that baseline information to be able to project what kinds of changes we're going to expect in biodiversity going forward. So for that reason, um, the information is starting to come from more diverse places, I think. So um, we have very good science, of course, generating really good intel. Um, and regionally, that's going to take some time to come out. We use controlled experiments because, of course, uh, climate change is not one thing that's changing. It's many different things happening all at the same time in a seascape where we're also suffering things like sedimentation and fishing and these other pressures that we don't necessarily can't control very well. So for that reason, a lot of our climate change um, information in terms of how biodiversity will respond to impacts is done in a laboratory setting. Um, having said that, we have seen large uh, impacts overseas in, in response to ocean climate change. So the uh, collapse of ecosystems, the change in distribution of certain species, and we're in a position in New Zealand to heed that warning. So similar to the case that we have with coronavirus, we're somewhat isolated from the greatest impacts, I think, on biodiversity um, in New Zealand for several reasons. But, um, you know, we have an opportunity here to, I guess, address what is a huge environmental problem. Um, it is global, but we have a national capacity to respond. And the solution is going to be social. Um, and so that's something I think we just want to keep in mind that we're not going to always have all the information, but that shouldn't, uh, I guess, restrict us from being proactive and taking a proactive approach that we've seen work so well for our nation just very recently with coronavirus. Kia ora, Libby. I, yeah, that's given me a lot of the food for thought. Um, I'm going to go to Liana now. Liana, how are we using Matauranga Māori um, in Aotearoa? How is it informing the response to climate change? Yeah, I guess um, maybe I'll just try and define Matauranga a little bit more so that we can get a better understanding. It is its complete, its own knowledge system. So it's not just the knowledge, it's not just Māori knowledge that Māori hold. 
it's also the way in which we interpret it, the way in which we validate it, the way in which we analyze it. It's all within this whole system and it's all about connectivity. Um, so for example, um, we have a maramataka, which is the lunar calendar. Um, and that was utilized um, pretty much by everyone. They had different versions, but um, it was a lunar calendar that basically helped to inform the way in which we would interact with the environment. So on, a, say, a moon phase, there was tohu, which are signs in, in the environment that would tell you that you'd have to go out and start building your nets to um, catch the inanga, which are white bait, for example. Um, and so this system, um, as I said, was utilized to shape how we inter interact with um, the environment. And through wānanga, which is where all uh, experts would come together and have a good kōrero, or have a good talk about it, um, that's how the, the information was validated. So this, this system sits um, quite distinctly outside of science or any other knowledge system that was created. It has its own way of evolving. Um, and so when I think about from um, the use of that mātauranga Māori in the way in which we manage climate change, Kaitiaki are doing it right now on the ground. So Kaitiaki, our guardians that are interacting with the environment, with the marine environment, are using the tohu that the environment is giving them to influence the way in which they, they interact. And so an example of that is I have a couple of um, cousins who um, are rungawa experts, medicinal, Māori medicinal plants, um, who have noted that last year the pahutukawa bloomed twice, and that's not normal. Um, and in terms of normality, it has happened before, but um, it's, it seems to be a little bit more frequent at the moment. And so that's, that's, you know, putting up a question, oh, what's happening here? How, how, how is this change? Is this change an issue? Is this change just a yearly thing? And this is where Wānanga would come in, and this is when you would talk to somebody else who, who has knowledge, maybe from a different region or even um, internally, and that's when this mātauranga would start becoming um, a little bit more refined and analysed. So when from a climate change, it's happening right now. Um, how we're using it at the level to manage for climate change as a nation, big gap. Um, and that is partly because there is questions around how to utilize a knowledge system that isn't necessarily fully acknowledged within the current management system of our country. And so um, I think that's, that's probably where um, we need to put most of our our effort into as thinkers, as academics, as kaitiaki to go, okay, well, there is some knowledge and there's knowledge in, and there's value in mātauranga. How do we appropriately take that and utilise it for the betterment of Aotearoa um, and make sure that it moves as a whole and it doesn't get compartmentalized or it doesn't get reinterpreted or it doesn't get taken out of one knowledge system and put into another um so yeah i think that's yeah on the ground we're doing good the further up the chain it goes we've got a little bit of work to do kia ora liana and kirsty woods a question for you do you think our fisheries management system is adequate to support iwi to deal with the changes occurring as a result of climate change? Well, that, that's a big question and some people would think it's a loaded question. Um, and before I go ahead, I totally support what Liana just said. And I think that's part of what needs to feed the way we make decisions about fisheries. So I think the, the fisheries framework itself, it's like a big cardboard box. So the outside, the structure is there but there's a lot that needs filling in and a lot of detail that needs to be sorted out and issues within that framework. So we obviously, we have a, a system for setting catch limits. We've got requirements for mitigating, um, avoiding remedy, mitigating the effects of fishing on the environment and a number of principles in the Act that really mean that these are all responsibilities that, that we all share. Um, so we think that there's a lot more to do to actually enable quicker decision making, to enable Māori, Mātauranga Māori to inform decision making. Liana's right, 
we're talking about knowledge that's that's known on, in place and people are enacting um, initiating um, what you know particular projects or initiatives based on that in their local places but the big challenge is how do we build on that to inform the way we do things as a whole um, so for the commercial sector for example there's some big challenges in there in fact there's a lot of work that's been going on um, finding ways to innovate and Carl's told us about what he's doing but there's been work in, in other areas as well looking at modifying trawl nets, for example, to reduce the harvest of sea lions is another example. We need the system to be much more responsive. And so while we're facing these changes with fish moving, um, being affected by um, acidification and so on, we need to be able to make decisions and adjustments much more quickly. Um, and so what we think needs to happen is that while the minister's got overall responsibility for making sure that fisheries are managed in a sustainable way, we need a lot more scope to take out responsibility ourselves for developing management on the ground. Um, and as EWE collectively, um, we would see that, and we've been talking about this for many years and still really need to see it happen as, as a partnership in fisheries management alongside the government. And that needs to be happening at a national level, right down to the local level. And our challenge is to work out how we do that. Um, what else was I going to say there? I think that um, for Māori, um, thinking again about the commercial side, I'm aware that iwi collectively, and I've seen this in questions in there about commercial fishing, I think we can be satisfied that there are tools available to manage our impacts, but for Māori and iwi quota owners, they're interested in actually taking that further and looking at how do we make sure that our fishing is managed in accordance with Tūtanga Māori and what more can we do? So that's sort of trying to take the knowledge to the next level and look at how we apply it in a modern commercial setting as well. So the box with the framework is there. There's a lot more to do to actually make it robust. Kia ora, Kirsty. I think, you know, with the speed at which things have happened in the COVID crisis, it's interesting to see how quickly things can change virtually overnight and hopefully you know some of the things we've learned through this situation can be taken into the you know making things maybe a more dynamic situation because it appears you know what to put in the box yeah and um, i think that yeah I, I think for iwi to be able to make these sorts of steps we also need to be secure in the rights that we have so that we know when we're taking this action that we can benefit from the rights that we have but also take responsibility for what we're doing so. mm. And uh, yes, uh, true, in terms of a dynamic reaction that you don't lose, um, you know, any ground and indeed get. Um, okay, so a question now for you, Ron. Uh, you've been working in one of the country's best known marine reserves for many years. What changes over time have you observed and what role do you see that reserve playing in building resilience in the broader marine ecosystem with regards to climate change? Right, okay. Um, what have we seen change? Um, the Poor Nice Islands was a marine reserve that was made in 1981 and it was only 3% of the uh, actual reserve which was protected. The rest had a fishing notice. And so um, nobody knew what a 3% was and everybody was fishing with the floating lines and they were very happy with that. Uh, but it wasn't really sustainable. So from 1992 till 1996, we've been fighting to get 100% protection of the, of the islands. And in 1998, they became 100% uh, protected. Uh, from that time onwards, we've seen a, a, a huge increase in species around and the sizes of the fish. Lately, we've seen more subtropical uh, fish arriving and Irene Middleton has done some work on that. I think she's identified about 15 species so far. Really exciting. People making uh, photos on the water and video actually helps us to share uh, the experiences. So the marine reserve is, 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 is really useful in, in showing um, what we used to have because what we've lost is our baseline. And when you talk to uh, our elders and, and a couple of generations back, you'll see that people used to step into the water and pick up crayfish. And nowadays there's no more crays in, uh, around the Auckland area. We've just been industrial overfishing uh, in all sorts of levels, not just the fishing, it's all, that all sorts of reasons why there's a decline. But, I uh, think um, things like bottom trawling, um, and with all due respect to Carl, 
Um, if you look at the damage on the sea floor from that fishing method, um, I, I would say it is not very sustainable. We, uh, we keep on damaging our environment and, and we have to wait all the time for more science. Um, I don't think it's very sustainable in, in the last, uh, again, in the last generation, what we have lost um, in our baseline of fisheries is significant. And if we keep on talking about, oh uh, yeah, but we have to wait for this, we have to wait for that. Look, we've only got, what is it, 0.4% of marine reserves around New Zealand, marine protection. Look at Nui, they've got 40%. Yeah. Um, look, what we should be doing uh, is getting 30%, and whether we call it a Rahui or a marine reserve or marine protection, or more, right? we need to do something. We haven't done enough. And um, quite frankly, um, I'm getting very tired of it because we do a lot of quarter or a lot of talking and we don't seem to make a lot of progress. And yet an eight-year-old can tell you that if you take too many fish out of the ocean, it's not going to be good. And yet we just keep on doing it. Have a look at the cod fishery uh, that happened in the 1970s um, in the North Atlantic. Um, days before the whole system collapsed, uh, we had the official reports that things were going fine. It was sustainable. There's none left now. And, and so we learned those lessons from uh, over there and hopefully we all learned them, but we need to have a little bit more action. And my challenge is, is to the next generation really to sort of really get onto it at the moment because we're on a sliding scale of, of losing our marine biodiversity and, and climate change is not ha helping with this, but it's not the only thing. So that's sort of the, the value of marine reserves coming back to the start is to give us a connection with how uh, the marine life can be and has been in the past. Kia ora, Joron. Um, that's uh, also very sobering to food for thought. I'm going to go to James now. You are very outspoken in the field of marine protection, and, and rightly so, and particularly in Te Kapa Moana, the Hauraki Gulf. In fact, two of your recent stories that are available on New Zealand Geographic are incredibly, um, you know, from your heart and I think that everybody should read them if you haven't already. But um, as we know, climate change is one of the massive threats to these vital marine ecosystems. What are some of the solutions? Because your most recent piece, I was um, delighted to see some actual ideas for solutions. What are the solutions in your mind to that could help build resilience? Yeah, well, I mean, resilience is the key word, isn't it? Um, I've present all of this by saying I'm not a climate scientist, you know, um, but New Zealand Geographic has reported on climate science for, for three decades now. So while I can't give you kind of high resolution insights into very specific problems, I can give you a very low resolution observation over a wide area, I suppose. Um, and, and I feel like climate change is widely regarded as one of these wickedly complex and completely intractable problems, but um, it's not entirely true. You know, there are solutions and we just haven't deployed them yet. Um, We've seen some really similar uh, wicked climate problems solved before. If you think back to the halocarbons uh, of the 1970s, the refrigerants that were used in refrigeration and other things, and the world came together around the uh, Montreal Protocol in uh, 1987 or, or around about late, 90, late 80, sorry, somewhere around there. And Today, uh, the ozone hole is, um, is smaller than it has ever been since about 1982. So we can fix these invisible atmospheric global problems. We've done it before. Um, we just need to understand the science and respond in a politically expedient way. Um, if we've learned anything from COVID-19, uh, it's the speed at which governments can move to avert catastrophe. Uh, and it's also been something of a revolution in science communication as well. And you know, this is my area, this is where I sort of have to take it on the chin that in many respects for climate science, um, New Zealand Geographic has, has failed New Zealand because we haven't managed to communicate some of the most pressing issues and solutions. Um, but for the first time now, I feel like the public understands uh, exponents uh, like we've never understood them before. We understand the value of um, projections. Um, we understand the power of uh, personal, public uh, and political sort of interventions to change the course of the inevitable. Um, 
So why we haven't been able to, well, I've been able to do that for COVID-19 and we haven't been able to do that or bring that same sense of urgency to climate or the marine spaces is a little bit beyond me. Um, but it comes down to reducing emissions, um, of course, uh, and in the marine space, uh, it comes down to resilience. Um, the marine space cannot be uh, resilient when it is in a compromised state. So we have to be careful about what we take out and we have to carefully consider what we put in. Um, what we take out in terms of extractive um, things like commercial, recreational fishing and the fisheries methods that we use, uh, the oil and gas, what that's doing to the benthic environment, uh, understanding our inputs being pollution from rural sources, uh, from urban sources, and then protection, setting aside a small portion of uh, our sea area and protect it from extraction and inputs. So science suggests 30% uh, by uh, 2030. Um, New Zealand currently has 0.37% uh, protected, which is a shameful um, position for a country that had the first marine reserves in the world. Um, those marine reserves, they need to be representative ecosystems um, to be valuable and they need to be large enough uh, to be valuable. So it comes down to extractions, inputs, protection. Um, Libby referred earlier to the solution being social and, and I'd agree with that. Uh, Liana referred earlier to this reciprocal relationship for uh, of kaitiakitanga. Um, and it occurs to me that you know, Western society is the only society in the world where somehow we've been able to divorce rights and responsibilities. We've been able to give rights to one group to exploit a resource and responsibilities to another group uh, to try and regulate that process. And that's broken. Um, we need a marriage of those rights and responsibilities again. Perhaps we need to reframe it as um, the Fjordland and Marine Guardians do in terms of uh, gifts and gains where we all have to give up something in order to get something. Um, yeah, extraction, input, protection. That's the solution, I think. <coughs> Here's a rather big question, and anyone can answer it. Put your hand up. Why is it taking so long? What are the hurdles? <laughs> I think it's slow moving. I think, we, I, I think it's too slow moving. I think we feel like we've got time. And yet, uh, when you see the number of new cases of um, COVID-19 you know, shooting up, you realize that you don't have time to react. Um, but over, over a long course, we feel like it's, you know, we can wait another day. Kirsty, you? Um, I think the question is, why is it taking so long to do what? And, I, and people talk about marine protection and that we're very slow at it. But I think people value the oceans for a whole lot of different reasons. And we need to be clear about what we're protecting the oceans for. And certainly from our point of view and the Māori point of view, it's very much about an ongoing relationship of give and take and sustenance more like a sustainable utilisation approach. And so the protection that we need is from risks posed by the things that we do. And we need to be quite deliberate about identifying what those are. And, and I think marine reserves are one thing. They're established for a particular purpose. But if we're talking about protecting the marine environment from fishing, that's part of that box that I was describing. And there are tools in there that enable us to do the research, to really debate robustly what that means and then what we should do about it. And I think that a lot of what we need to do is within that framework. And it's not about putting 30% of our oceans into no-take areas. I, I think that gets in the way of our relationship. We need to have a much more nuanced response to these problems. Yeah, so I think, I think it's a broader question. That's really helpful. And oh, you're on. Yeah, 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 well, of course, uh, I have a feeling about it. So I do think 30% uh, by 2030 is the minimum we should be going for. Leave 70% for um, other activities. Uh, if we don't do it, we can keep on talking round and round and round. There's nothing left. Have a look at what we have lost in the last 50 to 100 years. It is significant. And so um, we need to look at rights from the ocean as well, not just rights of all the people that sort of have activities on the ocean, but 
we should see that the, the, the planet is like a person as well. And, and Maori Dom has been very good with that. They name rivers and give it personhood. So should the ocean be. The ocean should be protected. And there's a next generation coming up. And if we leave them with nothing, then shame on us. Kia ora, Yoron. And Liana. Yeah, just quickly, um, I think one of our um, issues is that we're very good at looking back, but we're not very good at looking forward. So climate change is framed as, as an impact. It's not framed as a what we want for the future. We don't want to be impacted by climate change. We want something different. So what we're very good at is going, oh, okay, well, climate change will protect. Maybe we'll do something here. Maybe we'll do something there but we've lost track of what the values are of the marine environment that we want to hold on to for our future. And so if we just turn a little bit and reframe it to go, okay, we know climate change is happening, but what are our values that we want to hold on to and we want to keep? And then how are we going to keep those? If we want fish, if we want to be able to swim, if we still want to be able to go down and connect, then how are we going to manage what is coming at us currently? And, and I think that is the biggest issue. We're, we're still in the, this is a problem, rather than how are we going to get from here to there. Kia ora, Liana. Libby. Libby. Kia ora, everyone. Um, yeah, so building, I guess, on what Liana and Kirsty have said, and I guess what's been said so far in the panel, and I don't want to preempt discussion that will happen around marine protected areas later in the series, but I do want to say that I think um, the discussion about marine protected areas or not is not, um, it's not a binary one. You know, there are, there are different kinds of marine protected areas, some that enable use or take of certain resources. Um, and this is the kind of discussion we're having at the moment in New Zealand marine scientists um, forums, where there is going to be potentially rezoning of our marine environment. There'll be different degrees of protection. Some will be exclusive in that there will be no um, fishing potentially, but there'll be many other kinds of protection where fishing will be allowed. And in fact, maybe the way we think about marine reserves should not be about anti-fishing. It's really about trying to build the resilience of those marine populations that we do fish, some of them, but also those marine ecosystems into the future so that they can cope with climate change. So think about marine reserves as, and marine protected areas as potentially being your friend. You know, we want to build resilient so that we can sustain our lifestyles because we are part of this ecosystem as well. We are part of it. Um, so building that resilience of our marine biodiversity is really a numbers game and a diversity game. We want to increase the numbers of um, individuals within a species found in our marine environment and maybe we can do that and still maintain some fishing. Um, and we also want to increase the diversity which relies upon there being um, a large, I guess, number of populations for a species, so diversity is maintained throughout the species, um, as well as there being diversity within any one um, area. So I would just advocate for, I guess, a reframing of the definition as to why we protect areas. It's not anti-fishing. Um, it's really about enabling us to live sustainably within our environment. Um, and secondarily, just to also think about the fact that marine reserves are here to serve us as well as the environment. So there are different ways that we can protect our environment or have marine protected areas without it being exclusively no fishing. Kia ora. Kia ora. Oh, Kirsty. Sorry, I just, just quickly, um, I think just as a context for that, I think that thinking about a partnership perspective in the treaty, that, that and our own knowledge, that, that that has to be brought to bear to this discussion as well. And if you're talking marine protection generally, that can be through various means, not just through a specific tool like a Marine Reserves Act or some new marine protected area, it can be done in all sorts of ways to, um, and, and so I guess our offer is that, that we have a particular view and so on and an approach to bear on this. Well, Kirsty, that leads in quite nicely to our, um, a question from one of the um, watchers, be viewers. I have read that commercial fishing has a strong negative impact on Te Moana. How do iwi balance or carry out manage kaitiakitanga um, responsibilities in this context? What kind of negative impact they, they've read about, um, the, the, the questioner? Um, I think for iwi, uh, the, the management of fisheries, whether it's commercial or non-commercial, essentially it's still subject to the same requirements that you, the stock itself has to be sustainable and there's ongoing research 
to look at, at what the status of fish stocks is. And in fact, since the quota management system, we're in a much better place than we used to be with fisheries were collapsing. Um, there's also the vexed question of different fishing methods and their effects, and Carl has talked about what he's doing. Um, and just really, there's a, there's a requirement to sort of adapt and gradually improve where you're having a, a negative impact. Um, so without actually knowing more specifically what question, what was behind the question, what kind of impact, I just say that um, commercial fishing can be managed and is managed on a sustainable basis, and, and iwi are all part of that system and benefit from it, but also want to make sure that management from now into the future is in accordance with, with te kaunga and Māori values. I've got a question for Carl, but first of all, Liana, your hand is up, and then Carl, I'm going to come to you. Liana. Yeah, yeah, just very quickly, just putting a disclaimer out there as well. Um, not all Māori think the same, just like not all people think the same. Um, and kaitiakitanga is a principle, and so if you if you live by kaitiakitanga, then the whole system is balanced. You're going mm. to be a part of it and you're going to have that reciprocal relationship. What gets difficult is that um, some iwi, some hapu, some whanau, some individual Māoris have decided not to live by those principles. And so we will see, I mean, you know, Māori aren't angels. We're not saying we know, know a whole lot of stuff. We know stuff based on those principles. And if those principles are practised, then that is where we make our biggest, biggest game. Disclaimer. Kia ora, Liana. Um, Carl, I just wanted to ask you as a commercial fisher person, so you've been on the ocean for decades. You've seen um, the effects of climate change. Can you talk to us a little bit about the effects you have seen and also your solutions as an actual commercial fisher person, even a small you know, take person, um, to mitigate some of that, pro those problems? Yeah, so... <clears throat> Climate-wise, uh, during the summer months, we used to get a lot of the primary food chain coming into the shallow regions in Southern Hawke's Bay. So this is, uh, so a juvenile pilchard is called a sardine and uh, anchovy. So they're the first on the food chain ladder up from your plankton. So if you've got plankton, these guys are eating that and then most of your other predatory fish species are eating them. So they're a very key part of the base of the food pyramid. So I'm noticing that they're not turning up in my area in summer. It's not to say that they're not still present. I hear from other fishers who have bigger vessels and fish further out that they're seeing increased or pretty voluminous food uh, markings out in deeper water. But uh, I guess what's interesting to note is they're not coming to where they traditionally were coming. So that's been a big change. To speak to the question about what are we doing and why is this taking some time? It's a good question. So that little device I've got on the end of my net reduces the number of juvenile gurnard that are coming into that net or being caught by over 95%. So pretty much for every one gurnard that I bring home, it's a nice size, there's another little fish that's escaped unharmed that's swimming off there and becoming next year's fish. Now that device uh, is uh, seven, six or seven years old. I still can't get the government to put up their hand to say, we'll pay the scientists to do an official review over it so that we can ratify it as being the success that it is. Even though I'm sending catch effort data to Ministry of uh, Primary Industries every day that I fish, which shows the volumes and what I'm catching and what's going on. So. I guess, you know, uh, my first port of call is where's my public calling for action and demanding that if you want change, where is it and who's monitoring it? I, I think there's this process where the public uh, trust the regulator to get the job done and they get busy with everything else in their life, just as I do. I, I haven't followed up and I haven't made an effort as to where all this rock phosphate is coming out of Morocco and, and whether that's a clean and tidy thing for the dairy community. I'm trusting the regulator to do that. But I think this is one of the big downfalls. If we, if we take what we are seeing as individuals and don't act upon it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the backstop of the regulator is going to come forward and make it happen for us. I, I think the key or a big part of the key to solving our responses to climate change is making sure 
as a united citizen group, we're asking and we're demanding to see evidence that our regulators and our uh, tax gathering body who's supposed to be charging up and making these is actually getting the results out there. Um, so I, I'm sitting with, uh, you know, I've had three attempts at a funding bid to take uh, facial recognition of fish connected to mechanical sorting. So there is no bycatch. So you put a commercial fishing device in the water, it has no bycatch. Now we've had three goes. We finally got uh, success at uh, getting funding for that through MB. We are now facing ourselves on the back foot with international position. We were world leading in that area. That we were the first to come up with that idea. Now we're chasing the team because other countries have got on and taken action. We're behind the eight ball. Why is this process happening? Why can't I, even, even though I'm a small one person fisher, why can't I get my government and my people to recognize a good idea when they see it? People, around, people I bump into in the street love it. They're asking what's going on. So you oh, know, there's a breakdown. Absolutely. I know that that's a question that people are going to be asking um, beyond the, the time of this seminar. Has anyone else got anything they need to say? We have actually got to the end of our, um, of our allotted hour. Is anything else anyone would like to close with? No, well, I just want to say thank you all so very much. We always knew that one hour was going to be um, ridiculously short, but that's what we've got. And I wish we had whole days, but this dialogue doesn't end right now. In fact, it's ongoing and it's vital that we use these discussions as tools for change. Um, do please join us next week for our panel on Wednesday, June the 3rd, same time, same channel, same event, Bright Booking System, for our fourth event about marine protection in Aotearoa, with a focus on what precisely a marine protected area is and why MPAs are important for Aotearoa. Our speakers next week include Associate Professor Nick Shears from the Lee Marine Laboratory at the University of Auckland and Samara Nicholas, co-director and founding trustee of the Mountains to Sea Conservation Trust. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do please email any thoughts or queries to marine at doc.gov.nz. Ka kite anō te whanau. And to close today, I ask Liana for a karakia. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa, um, i te tua tahi, tēnei te mihi ki a koutou, ngā kai kōrero, um, koutou katoa, um, e, mataki, e matakitaki ana i te ahiahi nei, uh, me e noi tātou. Unu hia, unu hia, unu hia ki te uru tapu nui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngā kou te tīnana, te wairua i te ara tangata, ko ia rā e rongo, whakaria ake ki runga, kia tīna, tīna, huie, tāe ki e.